<laughs> Thank you. I, I look great in a tie. It's <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm giving you the global picture. I will try to be as abstract and irrelevant to your experience as possible. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to talk about what it means to live in the age of austerity. Now, in, in some ways, you know better than any of us what it means to live in the age of austerity you are delivering its consequences and seeing them on the ground every day. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about how we got here globally and maybe a hint of how we get out of here because this is not the place for us to be. So let me start the story in 2009. 2009, and I'm going to start it overseas. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about how my own experience overseas looking back at Canada shifted my perspective. I'm going to start this in 2009, a speech that David Cameron, now a UK Prime Minister, gave to the Conservative Convention in, in the UK just before becoming Prime Minister. In that speech, he set out the sort of the frame that captures thinking, austere, what I would call the austerians, uh, hysterical commitment to cutting. And he, he sets out the frame that now represents pretty much the way all political parties in developing, developed countries are thinking. What he said, first of all, was, yes, we are entering the age of austerity. He coined the phrase. He saw this as an opportunity to fix the errors of previous governments, to fix the problem, of the folly of, of overspending, of overbuilding government. That was. That was his, his position. So the problem in his mind was clear, spending. Spending was the problem. And the solution, obviously, the solution to generate growth, to reduce debt, was cutting. So the spending problem, cutting was the solution. Less government, shift resources from the public sector to the private sector, that will generate growth, that will generate greater innovation, that will reduce debt and deficit for future generations. He also said, reminiscent of Thatcher, there is no alternative. There is no alternative. That became a kind of guiding phrase for the Austerians. Cutting is the only option we have. Now you think about it, just take, take a moment and think about how much that has shaped our thinking. You know? So somebody thinks about a universal childcare system in Canada be a pretty good idea. And what is the first thing people say? Huh, we can't afford that. It has shaped our thinking. We'll come back to that. So that's the, that's the frame. 2009, Cameron announces we're entering the age of austerity. The problem is spending. The solution is cutting. The results will be economic growth, reduced debt. There is no alternative. 2010, Toronto hosts the G8 and the G20. And the theme of the G8 and the G20, the, the meeting of the most powerful developed nations, or among the most powerful developed nations, austerity. And who is the champion of austerity? Canada. We were selling what we called fiscal consolidation at the time, but we were selling austerity as a solution. You name the problem, austerity is the solution. And we were the world's darling on austerity because we had successfully balanced the budgets in the 90s, and we had ridden out the recession, the 2008 meltdown, better than most countries. So we were the fiscal darlings. We were known in the world. We were leaders on austerity. I mean, think, of, there was a time when we were leaders on social justice, quality of life, but no, no, now we're the leaders on austerity. And we sold it. We were lecturing and finger-wagging at other countries about how to manage their fisc, and you'd better cut. And we were here and we were there. Used to be, we talked about inclusion and decency and equality and commitments to children. But now we were talking about cutting and cutting and cutting. Not just cutting our own, but cutting yours and his and hers. World leaders in austerity. Now, a whole lot of countries turned to Canada and said, could you help us in how to achieve cuts? They turned to us because of the, the 90s uh, successes. So we, and we had a lot to teach them. 
But a lot, in, in teaching the lessons, we forgot a few messages. For example, we forgot to tell people that in the 90s, taxes were a lot higher than they are today. So we had more revenue to deal with things. We forgot to tell people that interest rates were higher then, which meant the cost of carrying debt was higher. But even more than that, by lowering interest rates, we could offset the consequences of some of the cuts. That wasn't available. But most profoundly, we forgot to tell people that we got out of the hole fiscally through growth, not through cutting. Growth in the American economy, we had a low dollar, and the Americans were spending. We were benefiting from huge American spending, a low dollar, and we grew ourselves out of deficit. The cuts didn't grow us. Growth grew us. A low dollar grew us. In other words, this is not the 90s. Two things to remember out of this talk, if you remember nothing else. We are not Greece. This is not the 90s. But notwithstanding all of that, by 2011, Austerity had spread across Europe and beyond, was infecting policies all over the place, making it appear that Cameron was right. This is the age of austerity. Okay, 2012, where are we, or 2013, where are we today? Well, I would say the gloss is coming off, the austerity, the austerian vision. The gloss is starting to come off. The first cracks in austerity are starting to show. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is, is enormous disruption, violence, and riots in the street in Southern Europe. Cars are being, are being exploded. People are, are engaging in violence. Uh, people are killing themselves. There's huge disruption. And that's a pretty good reason to rethink austerity. I mean, our public policies are not meant to generate disunity, disruption disease. But that's only one of the reasons. I'm not sure that's the biggest reason that policymakers are starting to rethink. The second reason is obvious. It's the human consequences, day-to-day -day human consequences, that are profound and fall most heavily on youth, women, and the most vulnerable, the people you deal with all the time. And you see it all the time. And you can't sustain that and rising inequality. You can't sustain that and run an economy or hold a society together. So that's the second reason, but I don't even think that's the dominant reason that policymakers are starting to rethink things. The biggest reason is it's not working to deliver even its modest economic and fiscal goals. In Europe, what you're seeing is huge pain, no gain. Deficits, debts and deficits aren't coming down. Growth is actually shrinking. The more you cut, the less you grow. Just as a, as, as a matter of interest, when everybody's cutting at the same time, everybody is reducing, there's no place for growth to come from. You don't have to be an economic genius to know that everybody can't shrink at the same time and still grow. You can't, well, I'll, I'll leave you to, to ponder the, the, the irony of, of, of austerian thinking. In the UK, for example, notwithstanding brutal cuts, far brutal than anything we've seen, the treasurer in the UK has had to, to constantly revise downward their growth predictions every year. They're growing less than they predicted every single time because cutting reduces growth. They've also had to push out their target for balancing the budget because no matter, cutting doesn't balance budgets. Governments are not like households. Governments don't work like households. The, um, in, in public finance, my spending is your income. Your spending is my income. If nobody's spending, nobody's got income. It's different. So it's not working. And it's interesting, the IMF, one of the most conservative international economic organizations, a pro austerity, has recently come out and said, hold on, austerity is not working. We've underestimated the costs of austerity, not just to people, but to growth. And they're cautioning, even us, 
slow down. Don't cut so deeply. Slow down your cutting. Be careful. One of the, the big scientific papers, a paper by two economists named Reinhardt and Rogoff that you won't know about, but was quoted by everybody, including Cameron in the famous speech, has been exploded as myth. So there is no empirical data to justify that all this cutting is going to regenerate anything but human suffering. In fact, I will say, Baldly, I do say things baldly, but I, I will say unequivocally, there is no instance where a country has been able to cut its way to growth. It has never happened. There has never been an instance. There is no recorded evidence that cuts will generate growth, that cuts are not the solution. That's not to say we shouldn't be fiscally responsible. That's not to say that over time, revenues and expenditures shouldn't be in rough balance. That's not to say that, that uh, we shouldn't be bringing down debt, especially in good times. That's not to say we shouldn't make wise spending choices and eliminate waste when we see it. That's not to say that. It's to say instead that austerity is not fiscally responsible, that cutting doesn't achieve our fiscal goals. Wise spending, smart investments, clever reallocation, investments in the future, those are the things that achieve our goals. I mean, think of the irony for a moment. 2008 uh, meltdown caused largely by kind of neoliberal economic theory that said the less government, the better, less regulation, the better. That, that this recession was the excuse used to do more of the same that brought us the recession. I mean, there's something crazy about this, that the very policies that got us in a hole, people are saying, could we use the same shovel to dig us down? It, it makes no sense. So okay, let me, <laughs> I, I, I could go on a, a rant here, but I'm gonna pull back and say, let's take a moment and look specifically at the Canadian, how, how am I doing for time? Oh, I've got another hour and a quarter. Okay. <laughs> I see a look of panic. So we make that an hour and 10. So I, I, I left the country in 2006. I was asked to leave the country. In two, uh, um, I left the country in 2006 for a few years. And when I left the federal government, the federal government had a $16 billion surplus. A $16 billion surplus. That made it, if, if a government, say the government of the day, the federal government of the day, had the same philosophy as Cameron, right? Government's the problem, cuts the solution. It's really hard to sell when you have a $16 billion surplus. It's a very much harder case to sell to people that you can't have pensions and Medicare, or you have to wait for your pension, you can't afford to increase welfare, you can't afford the social programs that make a difference in people's lives, active investments and skills. You can't afford that when you have a $16 billion deficit. You can't afford municipal funding, you can't afford transfers, increasing the gas tax transfer, you can't afford all that. It's hard to make the case when you have a $16 billion surplus every year. So what do you do? You cut taxes get rid of the surplus. So what did we do? While I was gone, they cut two cents out of the GST. HST, GST. Do you know what that costs every year? How many of you know? $16 billion surplus, two cents of GST, $14 billion every year. And nobody opposed it. A little change in our pockets, and we stripped the government of its capacity to help us in tough times. $16 billion surplus, $14 billion tax cut, no debate. That was on top of accelerated corporate tax cuts that more than filled the extra $2 billion of room. Accelerated because they were started by the liberals and accelerated by the conservatives. That was on top of boutique tax cuts for middle class people and the upper middle class who needed the help least. That was on top of provincial tax cuts in virtually every province. And that was on top of the tax cuts of the year 2000 by the liberals, which were the biggest in Canadian history. Now imagine, this is 
tens of billions of dollars of taxes gone with no debate. Imagine that some portion of that had not been given away. The federal government, at least, would have been in a position to ride out the recession, to help provinces that needed the help, to help municipalities that needed the help, to invest in a greener, cleaner economy, education and skills, and to start transforming our social and health programs so that they're there working for future generations. So I come back to Canada, and what do I hear? I hear now that Canada is in a climate of austerity. It was, it was interesting, and this is a, kind of irrelevant to your experience, but I was interested in federal government. I'd worked in the federal government for 30 years. The opposition, the, the liberal opposition, every Wednesday had a, a, a media event that they called Waste Wednesdays, where they would announce to the media the, the latest way that the conservative government was wasting money. Think about it. The opposition, the biggest criticism they could find of this government was that they were wasting money, that they were profligate, big spenders. Everybody had gone nuts. Nobody was focusing on the future. Everybody was trying to outcompete the other as the biggest fiscal hawk. Shortly thereafter, there were four men in a, in a debate leading, into, or leading out of the 2011 election. I don't remember that, but it was four men because Elizabeth May was excluded. It was four men kind of my generation vaguely, which is part of the problem. You know, my generation is so much more interested in holding on to what we got than building something new. But that's another speech for another day. Um, four men competing to be the biggest fiscal hawk the biggest tax cutter. Nobody wanted to look like they were a tax and spender. It had infected, Osteria had infected everybody like some kind of horrible disease. The whole debate, these four guys, this is from social democrats, separatists, liberals, conservatives, the whole debate, you would have never known that there was a climate change problem. Don't believe it came up. You would never know there was rising inequality. You would never know there were intergenerational inequities or huge pockets of urban po poverty. And a lot of poverty is playing out most profoundly in cities, by the way. You would have never known. What you knew was spending was the problem, cutting was the solution. And the difference was how quickly you'd cut and how quickly you'd reduce taxes. Conservatives cut quickly, reduce taxes quickly. Liberals would reduce taxes kind of in the middle, not too hot, not too cold. It was horrifying. OK. So here we are in Canada. By the way, I've written a number of articles on this. And people will say to me, Canada, we're not in austerity. Can't, can't, it's not, we're not cutting like Britain. We're not cutting like. We are in austerity and slow motion. And in austerity and slow motion is some ways more insidious than the big stuff because it's hard to rally opposition because it's hard to see in some ways the long term. Now, it's austerity and slow motion, who gets hit? What are the consequences? The first hit on austerity and slow motion are the politically sexy targets, the ones where you could actually win some points politically by cutting them. Who are they? Public servants. You never lose politically by attacking public servants. That's an easy target. Uh, public servants, fat bureaucrats, bloated bureaucracy. You know you're not allowed to say bureaucracy if you don't proceed it by the word bloated, right? Um, <laughs> so target one, the easy political targets. And what that does, it reduces morale. It makes this kind of profession that we're all committed to in one way or another less attractive. It erodes the institution. It divides workers, public and non-public workers, unionized and non-unionized workers, divides them against each other. It's really destructive. That's the first target. But politically, it's an easy sell. So who's the second target? The second target is the most vulnerable because there are small political costs. Who, are, who in Canada are the most vulnerable? Are the ones taking it? Refugees, migrant workers. The cuts there have been profound, inhuman, horrifying. The unemployed and the poor. So in, in some profound way, austerity and slow motion makes us meaner. 
and we're becoming a meaner place. That's pretty scary, because it's not long before we take for granted that there is no other way. And of course, there is another way. The third consequence, of course, is, is a kind of slow motion erosion of the social services, social programs, and institutions that we depend on, including, in our case, federally and provincially, the environmental uh, processes that are meant to, to protect our environment. And those, that erosion plays out very slowly, and very often we don't realize it's happened until it's very late in the game. Much better to catch it before it's happened. And then the final consequence I would describe is it, it, li it limits our political imagination. Austerity makes us stupid because it makes us feel like we can't afford anything. We can't afford to make things better. We can't afford to invest in kids. We can't afford to make intergenerational equity a priority. We can't afford. It makes us stupid. And we focus on nickel and dime cuts and survival instead of on the future, the investments that are going to make us stronger and the reforms that are going to make our programs work more effectively. So huge opportunity costs. What's the alternative? Almost anything. You're going to move me out? Well, just two seconds then on the alternative. <laughs> the alternative is to let me speak a lot longer. But, 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 but short of that, short of that, you just look at what's happening on, on the ground. I don't know more. The student protests in Montreal, the Occupy movement, the people fighting against uh, pipelines. Those movements are coming closer and closer together and are starting to link up. Great change starts from the ground. And there's a real sign that people have had. I call the, these all parts of one movement, the enough already movement. It's time for a change. And the, 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 leading, the leading place to achieve that change will be a conversation on taxes. Because as much as we get the government we demand, we also get the future we're willing to pay for. Thank you. Thank you.